Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kaniska, that you joined our seminar. So today, uh, Kaniska will give a talk on uh, Sri Lanka uh, a crisis protection left strategy. So he will speak about the current developments in Sri, in Sri Lanka the last uh, two years and how this is connected to the wider crisis of neoliberalism the last uh, uh, few decades. So thank you, Kaniska, again, and the floor is for you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for having me here. And I know there are other interesting events uh, happening today, so thanks for being here. Uh, uh, so in Sri Lanka, crises and protests of various kinds have not been rare, but the scenes witnessed there in late spring and early summer last year were quite uh, unprecedented. Uh, common people playing in the swimming pool of the country's president, a Buddhist monk enjoying the comfort of his bed, and someone playing happy tunes on his grand piano. Such were the scenes circulating in social and global media, no sooner than a mammoth crowd of angry protesters burst into the presidential secretariat on July 9th, 1922. That was the high point of what is known in Sri Lanka as the Aragalaya, the struggle. I will use this word often in this talk, Aragalaya. That means struggle. Within days of what looked like the Sri Lankan version of the storming of the Winter Palace or the Bastille, President Gotabe Rajapaksa fled the island and resigned. So the Aragale, the struggle, inconceivable as a political movement 12 months ago, achieved its improbable objective coded in the ubiquitous slogan and hashtag, Gota, go home. Gota is the short form for the name of President Gota Bear Rajapaksa. I will use that name as well in the short form, Gota, Gota go home. Yet, barely a month after that, month after 9th July uh, last year, this magical Aragale had revealed itself to be a spent force. How then are we to make sense of the spectacular rise and fall of the Aragale, the struggle, a political movement capable of deposing a popularly elected, if inept, president, but unable to sustain itself as a mass movement even for a few weeks beyond the incredible achievement of its stated objective. Commonplace, liberal, and even many left accounts of the Aragale are of limited use with respect to this question, not least because of their overwhelming obsession with the legendary misdeeds of the ruling Rajapaksa family. Typical in this genre is a report on Sri Lanka in The Guardian, July last year, featuring the expert opinion of Paikya Sothi Saravanamuttu, the executive director of the lavishly funded colombo based NGO, Center for Policy Alternatives. For him, the essence of what happened in Sri Lanka last year boils down to a familiar refrain. I quote, the Rajapaksas were venal and corrupt. Their regime has nothing to commend itself, end quote. To judge from corporate and social media, much of the Aragale also thought rather like The Guardian, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and elite NGOs of Sri Lanka that the allegedly pro-Chinese Rajapaksas were the real problem. But it was not quite so. We would be better served by a longer historical and deeper political perspective, with some attention to the economic dimension of the political crisis in Sri Lanka as well. The most immediate existential catalyst for the Aragale, it must be recalled, were the depressingly long lines of cars waiting to fill up petrol and people from many walks of life in search of essential cooking gas, coupled with 13-hour power outages, all of which appeared in the months leading up to Gota's res resignation and unusually inconvenience the upper echelons of the social order. Accompanying such discontents was runaway inflation, coupled with a precipitous depreciation of the rupee against the dollar which affected especially the precarious middle and lower classes who joined their upper class masters in street protests at a scale and intensity unmatched in Sri Lankan history. 
Yet the apparently cross-class, ethnically diverse and spontaneous character of these protests gathering momentum in March last year also concealed as much as it revealed. The notably upper class character of the Aragale was evident in the protest movement's unmistakable urban concentration, initially along several streets of Colombo and then centered in the largest public space of the city, Gaul Face. I will uh, refer to that also uh, several times. Uh, Gaul Face, which uh, looked rather like Tahrir Square or Gezi Park during the Arab Spring in the tense weeks leading up to July 9th. But the most telling sign that this uprising was not predominantly a movement of the oppressed classes could be seen in the very slogans held up by visibly agitated protesters, a vast majority of which were scribbled in English, the language of the upper classes of all ethnic groups in Sri Lanka, as if the whole struggle for a system change was curated for a cosmopolitan nor Western audience rather than the Sri Lankan masses. Nor is it insignificant that one of the most ardent supporters of the Aragale on Twitter was Julie Chung, the US ambassador in Colombo, who was frequently seen entertaining local social media influencers and the liberally reformed leader of an ex-Marxist political party, the Janata Vimukti Paramuna, the JVP. The impression of the Aragale in social media which was heavily influenced by cutting edge Sri Lankan advertising companies and NGOs with links to such organizations as the National Endowment for Democracy in the US was much the same as that of the streets. Most of these protesters seemed fixated on the resignation of Gota or regime change with hardly a reflection on the nature of the crisis that brought them into the streets and what could possibly address it. Aside from the not too infrequent injunction to get a loan from the IMF to presumably turn on electricity and start pumping petrol. <clears throat> Calls for the government to go to the IMF side by side with talk of system change, such was the celebrated diversity and broad political spectrum of the Aragalaya that seemed to have united, at least in the global media, the whole island in a mass movement armed with the Gota Go Home hashtag against the rule of the Rajapaksas. But, Al, but as Althusser would say, every child knows that petrol queues, power cuts, and inflation were caused less by merely one nefarious ruling family, but more by dwindling foreign exchange reserves, itself the inevitable and overdue result of an economy that had run for too long on too much borrowed money. The COVID-19 pandemic in the form of sharp drops in revenues from tourism and remittances from workers abroad, the two greatest sources of foreign exchange for Sri Lanka, only snapped an already brittle economic structure, one that had been importing more than it could pay for with exports and covering up the deficits with loans from various foreign lenders. This pattern, which had been most pronounced since Sri Lanka was opened up to free trade in typical neoliberal fashion in 1977, the, year, the last year in which a positive trade balance was recorded, this pattern is the real debt trap that needs system change. It is unfortunate that all too often Sri Lanka's uh, debt trap is attributed only to China, which accounts for 10% of Sri Lanka's foreign debt the same as does Japan, while nearly half of it is in fact owned by a few investors of finance capital, particularly fund of international sovereign bonds. BlackRock, JP Morgan Chase, Prudential, Ashmo Group, UK, uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, Alliance uh, Germ from Germany, and UBS from Switzerland. Especially in view of the higher interests charged by these intrepid uh, financiers from cash-strapped countries in the international sovereign bond market, we should note that more than half of Sri Lanka's recent debt service flowed into the copper coffers of these vulture capitalists. Their role in Sri Lanka's external debt was highlighted by an international group of 182 high-profile academics, including Jayati Ghosh from uh, India, Thomas Piketty, uh, 
Yanis Varoufakis and Kostas Lapovitsas in a recent call for significant debt cancellation as a means to address the country's acute economic crisis. The Committee for the Abolition of Illegitimate Debt also issued a statement called the Colombo Declaration on December 4th last year. In it, the committee uh, advocates a position that I also uh, endorse. We oppose seeking a bailout agreement with the IMF as a way out of the crisis. I'm quoting the, the Colombo Declaration here. We are aware that the policies funded by the IMF have worsened Sri Lanka's food and energy dependency and insecurity, exacerbated the ecological and climate crisis, greatly increased inequality, and reinforced the trend towards an authoritarian regime. The government wants the IMF loan to resume debt payments to the bondholders and negotiate a re reduction of 10 to 20 percent. This will certainly strengthen the bondholders. We feel that it can be reduced by 80 percent if Sri Lanka avoids the IMF route and continues the suspension of debt payments. In this case, it would be in a strong position to demand a buyback of bonds at an 80% discount. Uh, so one of the positive developments of these statements uh, uh, on uh, debt uh, is that there's a growing awareness uh, uh, of the problems of the IMF route uh, uh, that is being uh, promoted by the dominant interests, both uh, globally and actually locally. Uh, there, is a, there are these debates. So one, one such uh, discussion is uh, scheduled to take place on the 22nd of February with uh, Yanis Varoufakis, uh, Jayati Ghosh, uh, signatories to that statement that I mentioned. Uh, uh, with uh, Indrajit Kumaraswamy, uh, a former uh, governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and a very neoliberal uh, ideologue you know, in his approach to these matters, as well as uh, Ali Sabri, uh, who was briefly the Minister of Finance you know, in the height, at the height of the crisis. Right? And, uh, it is also good to have uh, some perspective on the nature and the composition of the uh, sovereign debt. So in this graph, uh, which, is, which was uh, very uh, graciously given to me, I didn't make it, uh, by the chief economist of uh, UNDP in Sri Lanka, uh, Vagisha Gunasekar, you can see the red line, you know, which is the international sovereign bonds, you know, as a percentage of the sovereign debt, and the black line, is the uh, total uh, amount of commercial loans, you know, as a percentage of the uh, sovereign debt, you know, so the time frame is from 2005 to uh, the present, more or less. The role of these private lenders or vulture capitalists, as uh, uh, my former student uh, who wrote about them, uh, Drew Kaufman, co likes to call them, uh, see these vulture capitalists, you know, who have targeted many developing countries with structurally weak economies like Sri Lanka's, can be better appreciated with some historical background. It would be therefore useful as critical observers of the crisis in Sri Lanka, such as Shiran Ilan Peruma, a young uh, journalist in Sri Lanka, and Matt Withers, an Australian academic uh, who studies the Sri Lankan economy, and Prabhat Patnaik, the uh, well-known Marxist uh, economist from India, uh, as these people have done, to see Sri Lanka's present uh, situation in a longer political economic perspective, one that contextualizes the debt trap as a systemic problem dating back to even colonial days obviously with new developments and severe symptoms in our own uh, neoliberal times. As uh, Shiran Ilan Peruma says, I quote from a very uh, interesting article that he has written about the uh, debt crisis and the uh, protests. Uh, here I'm quoting, Sri Lanka's debt crisis dates back to the colonial plantation economy it, it, it inherited from the British Raj. When Sri Lanka gained dominion status in 1948, 
the economy was divided into a peasant sector dominated by subsistence agriculture and an export-oriented plantation sector dominated by cash crops such as tea, rubber, and coconut. The country's first government, on the advice of the World Bank, recklessly squandered foreign currency reserves while avoiding major industrial investment. By the 1960s, terms of trade began to shift irrevocably as the export of primary products and raw materials could not sustain the country's consumption of imported manufacturers. Sri Lanka sank into a trade deficit and was pushed into the IMF's arms in 1965. The attempt at a policy of import substitution was insufficient and further destabilized by powerful comprador interests, attempted coups, and a youth insurrection in 1971. Later, the first OPEC crisis hit the country hard, 1973, forcing it into a long bloody period of liberalization characterized by fire sales of national assets, union busting, ethnicized youth insurrections. Since then, and the ethnic conflict, of course, is not unrelated to the, these economic uh, problems. Since then, Sri Lanka's first uh, Sri Lanka's trade deficit and debt stock have only grown alongside the gradual deindustrialization of its economy. That's the end of my, uh, a long quotation from uh, Shirani Lanperuma. It was the Sri Lankan Marxist political economist S. B. D. D. Silva who laid out most comprehensively the background necessary for understanding the debt trap of Sri Lanka and similarly colonized countries in his great book, uh, The Political Economy of Underdevelopment, published in 1982. In this unjustly forgotten work, uh, sorry, in this unjustly forgotten work outlined how British colonialism in Ceylon fatally transformed the island into a plantation economy, hindering above all the development of indigenous forces of production and prospects of industrialization. The book also offers a much needed critique of the dubious views on underdevelopment and prescriptions for development proposed by modernization theory and mainstream economics by explaining how policies derived from these doctrines led only to what Andre Gunder, uh, Gunder Frank called the development of underdevelopment. Yet the socialist oriented governments of post-colonial Sri Lanka, coalitions of more or less social democracy of the more or less social democratic Sri Lanka Freedom Party with the Marxist political parties of Sri Lanka, the Lanka Samasamaja Party, the LSSP, and the Communist Party. They attempted with limited success policies of industrialization in the 1948 to 1977 period, especially during 1970 to 1977, in the pre-neoliberal decades when import substitution industrialization or more accurately export-oriented industrialization was still possible to some extent as a way out of the dependence on primary commodity exports, tea, rubber, and coconut uh, for foreign exchange. But the watershed electoral victory of J.R. Javardana's United National Party in 1977, the neoliberal party, and the attendant decline of the Marxist left as a parliamentary political force brought a swift end to all that. As Sri Lanka entered the fateful age of neoliberalism, making a mockery of its economic and political sovereignty. As Aust Australian sociologist and scholar of the Sri Lankan economy, Matt Withers has reminded us, President Jayavardhana announced the coming of neoliberalism in 1977 with the declaration, let the rubber barons come. He dismantled import controls, destroying the heavily unionized industrial sector of the economy, floated the currency, deregulated the banking system, and created free trade zones for garment manufacturing. This was a historic defeat for the working class, uh, working people of Sri Lanka in the theater of electoral politics, as well as in the extra-parliamentary arena since the 1980 general strike called by the left parties was crushed by Javardana's UNP thugs with swords and bicycle chains. This neoliberal attack on the workers was coupled by an authoritarian populist declaration of war on the welfare state on the ideological front. 
inaugurating an era of unrestricted imports of all commodities, which could not be afforded by a weak export sector lacking an adequate industrial base. Low value added garment manufacturing, remittances from mostly cervix sector workers uh, abroad and tourism could not pay the bill for the necessi necessities and luxuries of domestic consumption. Over the next four and a half decades, terms of trade worsened at one point to 50% the value of imports approaching that of exports by a ratio of, uh, to a, a ratio of two to one. With increased reliance on borrowing to cover the trade deficit and to finance public expenditure amidst tax holidays for global capital and local merchants, the external debt to GDP ratio rose to 65% in uh, 2019, and the public debt to GDP ratio exceeded 120% by 2020. With regard to human welfare, the World Food Program and the UNICEF have both warned that six million Sri Lankans, nearly 30% of the population, are today food insecure and require humanitarian assistance. In his assessment of the current economic crisis in Sri Lanka against this historical backdrop, the renowned Indian Marxist economist uh, Prabhat Patnaik raises two important questions that relate the neoliberal long durée to the present conjuncture. Who is responsible for the turnaround in Sri Lanka's fortune from being a model welfare state before the onslaught of neoliberalism to being the sick man of South Asia today? And second question, while everyone would agree that the Rajapaksa government must take responsibility for the economic collapse, where exactly does the government's culpability lie? Readers of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Guardian will be familiar with the standard Western answer to the first question. As Patnaik puts it, I quote, the American establishment and the new cold warriors of that country put the blame on the Sri Lankan government's close economic relations with China, end quote. This view is a predictable geopolitical economic response given Sri Lanka's strategic location on China's Belt and Road Initiative and being next to India, although it lacks any explanatory value. Its popularity among Washington ideologues and their European underlings is nonetheless understandable if we recall how and why Gotha handily won the presidential election in 2019 and how his ruling coalition uh, party, uh, the ruling coalition, uh, also won a two-thirds uh, majority in the parliamentary election of uh, 2020. These overwhelming electoral victories were essentially a popular reaction to two issues. The dismal failure of the previous uh, Sirisena Vikramasinghe government, uh, the UNP uh, 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 coalition government, to deliver on its promise to eliminate the corruption of the former regimes of Mahinda Rajapaksa as uh, the, the Sirisena Vikramasinghe regime became embroiled in a corruption scandal of its own. And the other reason is the consequences of its aggressively neoliberal economic policy. So to quote uh, Ilan Peruma again, Gota's rise to power and the family's comeback in 2019 after their electoral defeat in 2015 was initiated less by ethnic uh, politics and more by the neoliberal policies and corruption of the uh, Sirisena Vikramasinghe government, which had entered into an IMF agreement in 2016. Withdrawals of subsidies on fertilizer and fuel had sparked protests by farmers and fishers uh, across the country. And that is the, uh, the Rajapaksa's uh, uh, main uh, voter demography. A multi-million dollar bond scam allegedly conducted by the central bank governor had dismayed the middle class, which was hopeful for an end to corruption. High indirect taxation had driven up the costs of living for the urban working classes. High interest rates and import liberalization had affected the fortunes of the domestic agricultural and manufacturing sector." End quote. 
the popular mandate received by Gota's regime in the 2019 and 2020 elections emboldened them to pursue some policies at odds with the previous government, including a few that departed, even if mildly, from the prevailing neoliberal practice and even rekindled repressed memories of import substitution industrialization efforts of those left-leaning coalitions, including the Marxist parties, the Trotskyite LSSP and the Communist uh, Party. This was signaled by the appointed as the governor of the central bank uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Gota regime, uh, the heterodox economics professor W.D. Uh, Lakshman, whose courses at the University of Colombo once featured Marx. As Ilan Peruma notes, uh, this move was poorly received by the comprador capitalists and economists at large because uh, Lakshman was well known as an ardent critic of the IMF and neoliberal policies. It indicated a modicum of ideological conviction by Gota's government, not for socialism, but for a national capitalist industrialization inspired by the East Asian Tigers growth model. Moreover, Gota's party, or at least its supporters, also signaled that they would move Sri Lanka out of the orbit of US imperialism by refusing to sign the USA's Millennium Challenge Compact, the MCC, or to reinforce military agreements with the uh, USA. Uh, uh, it is therefore naive to assume that Julie Chung, the US, ambas uh, the, uh, US ambassador in Colombo, was entertaining chosen politicians, social media influencers, and NGO leaders at her residence as the Aragale was in full swing, merely for purposes of entertainment. Now, Patnaik's second question concerning the role of Gota's government in the crisis. It is easy enough to note the series of their policy mistakes that worsened an already precarious situation marked by the pandemic. As Patnaik points out, the most obvious errors include a populist tax cut worsening the fiscal deficit, a ban on the import of chemical fertilizers leading to food grain shortages and excessive borrowing from private lenders in the form of international sovereign bonds. Although the previous government ramped up this trend of uh, you know, uh, selling international sovereign bonds and are responsible for 70% of the debt to international financial cooperation. That's a detail. As Matt Withers says, however, the fixation on Gota's interventions in the economy has lent support to a simplistic belief that Sri Lanka's macroeconomic problems would disappear under a liberal market economy uh, that is free of corruption. Uh, characteristic in this regard is the allegation of corruption directed mostly at the ruling Rajapaksa family rather than the big businesses that are reported to have parked their revenues and profits in dollars overseas by fraudulent misinvoicing or by using illegal means of money transfers such as Undial and uh, Hawala. For Patnaik, I quote, the problem with all these explanations, however, is that they completely ignore the role of neoliberalism in precipitating the Sri Lankan crisis. According to him, the debt crisis now faced by Sri Lanka and by Greece in 2009 uh, onwards must be distinguished from the more secular and structural features of capitalism, the day-to-day -day profiteering by capital at the expense of workers. He calls the Sri Lankan and Greek kind of crisis contingent and names the more quotidian operations of neoliberalism structural because the word contingency here points to the inability of governments faced with sovereign debt and budget deficit problems to know exactly how much borrowing is excessive before their debts spiral out of control in the volatile neoliberal conditions under which they are compelled to hedge their bets. <clears throat> As Patnaik says, a hallmark of such contingent crisis is that wisdom comes to everyone after the event. What is typically missed in these retrospective judgments, Patnaik argues, is one core lesson of the Sri Lankan, Greek, and other comparable crises, the incompatibility of the welfare state with neoliberalism. 
In the present uh, context, it should be recalled, as Patnaik does, that until 1977, I quote, Sri Lanka had built up a welfare state that was quite enviable in a third world context. And this was inherited even in attenuated form by all post-1977 regimes. Now, in the pre-neoliberal alternative universe in which this welfare state was achieved, it would have been possible to withstand a sudden drop in foreign exchange earnings, even without enlarging the country's external debt by cutting down on a variety of non-essential imports. But Patnaik is correct to point that that option is no longer readily available. Under neoliberalism, the government either has to cut back its expenditure, thereby attenuating its welfare state measures, or it has to keep its expenditure going, including on welfare state measures, by increasing the external debt. These are the only alternatives. In the latter case, as we know, if there is some delay in the recovery of foreign exchange earnings, then within a very short time, the debt becomes onerous and the country is caught in a debt trap, making any continuation of welfare state measures an absolute impossibility. This is exactly what happened to Gota's government, which attempted to do both welfare and neoliberalism, admittedly with avoidable errors that compound, compounded the principal contradictions of its economic policy. Patnaik then draws from the Sri Lankan experience a lesson that can be generalized to other similar countries, especially those with relatively small economies. Even if it, I quote, even if it may appear for a while that a country can combine welfare state measures with a neoliberal regime, the incompatibility between the two comes to the fore. At the first shock to the system, even if it is camouflaged for some time under normal circumstances, end quote. <clears throat> but let us not forget in the middle of all these details the essential contours of the Sri Lankan crisis. The basic form of the neoliberal prosperity ushered in Sri Lanka by the so-called open economy was aptly captured by Peter Kenneman, the former leader of the Communist Party in an election speech in 1982, which I still remember from 40 years ago. Uh, here, he compared J.R. Javardhana's 1977 UNP neoliberal regime to a village idiot throwing a wild party on borrowed money, only to then demand that all the guests share the debt and the hangover. A pithier image for the structural essence of the Sri Lankan economy from then to now, no matter which neoliberal party was in power, would be hard to find. The... Uh, the real question concerning the economic crisis in Sri Lanka is not about how it happened, but why it took this long for an Aragale, a struggle against it. Panagiotis walked in at exactly the right moment. I, you know. So without forgetting the economy, I would like now to return or to shift to the subjective and political moment of the crisis. Let me preface these reflections by submitting the thesis that there is no automatic relationship between crisis and protest in Sri Lanka or elsewhere. I am of course following here Alain Badiou's thesis that there exists no transitive relationship between economics and politics. I mention Badiou in particular because of his book, The Rebirth of History, uh, published in 2011, which offers an insightful theoretical reflection on a series of contemporary protests, the Arab Spring, the Occupy Movement, and urban riots in various cities by outlining the conditions of possibility of their political success from a revolutionary and indeed communist standpoint. One, cre one key premise of his thought, crisply formulated in the book Ethics, 1998, refers to Marx, Lenin, and truth. I quote Badiou. I think what is Marxist and also Leninist, and in any case true, 
is the idea that any viable campaign against capitalism can only be political. There can be no economic battle against the economy, end quote. I juxtapose this proposition to another one, a quotation from Lenin in Badiou's theory of the subject, 1982. I quote, politics is the concentration of the economy. These two Leninist propositions, I suggest, offer us two ends of a theoretical chain with which to think about the relationship between crisis and protest in Sri Lanka, bearing in mind another one of Badiou's thesis from theory of the subject. Every subject is political. This is why there are few subjects and rarely any politics. Politics for Badiou, in other words, is not business as usual. It is precisely a break from business as usual. My own view on the protests in Sri Lanka following Badiou is admittedly counterintuitive and no doubt controversial. The Aragalaya, the struggle, failed to achieve the status of politics understood in the specific sense proposed by Badiou and also in terms of the activists' own professed, if ill-defined, ambition of system change. Given the persistence of the economic crisis in Sri Lanka, however, the Aragale or the struggle, or rather some future reincarnation of it, may yet become political. With some hindsight, now it is possible to see petrol lines, power cuts, and rampant inflation as the troika of the most immediate causes that led thousands to the streets in Sri Lanka, including middle and upper class citizens, a vast majority of whom had never protested in public in their relatively comfortable lives. Yet an Aragale could also have happened for other reasons well before that. For example, during the UNP government's brutal repression of the general strike called by the left parties in 1980, or this Aragale could even have been avoided had Gota's regime resorted in April or May last year to the crucial crisis management measures successfully implemented by his appointed successor, President Ranil Vikramasinghe of the UNP by August uh, last year. And that measure was the rationing of fuel with an efficient uh, QR code system that was on the people's uh, mobile phones, which indeed got rid of petrol queues and abruptly neutralized the most vociferous and vacuous middle and upper class segment of the Aragale, leaving only a hard core of the Inter-University Student Federation and the Frontline Socialist Party, together with a handful of independent socialist anarchists and other postmodern activists, to take the Aragale beyond the spectacle of July 9th. Some radical unions of the public sector were also in dialogue with some of these groups without themselves being part of the Gulfface occupation. Without sustained mass support, however, by early August last year, the remainders of these groups in uh, golf face were easily mopped up by the repressive state apparatus now commanded by Vikramasinghe, the same apparatus that remained conspicuously restrained during the last days of the hapless Rajapaksa regime. Nonetheless, an overly negative judgment of the protest movement in Sri Lanka, despite evident shortcomings stemming from the vanguard role played in it by petty bourgeois and complot bourgeois elements, would be undialectical. Although it cannot be understood without reference to economic condition, the Aragale was above all a political process and a subjective experience. It enjoyed an autonomy of its own, which cannot be reduced to objective factors, including the dead weight of dominant class interests in it. Indeed, no observer of the prefigurative encampment set up in golf face by the most creative and dedicated activists of the Aragale could fail to register in what was called the Gotago Gama, uh, the reference to the actual location, uh, the same kind of radical, utopian, and youthful political energy that animated Tari Square and Gezi Park during the great mobilizations of the Arab Spring. Golf face from April to uh, July last year became the central site and hive of agitation outside of neoliberal capitalo parliamentarianism in Sri Lanka, thanks in large part to the students and other activists who occupied that public space and transformed it into a space ripe for politics. <laughs> 
a space suffused with wide-ranging debate on what is to be done, artistic experimentation, and other emancipatory activities. At a distance from the limits of liberal democracy, here a new generation awakened itself from its neoliberal slumber in the subjective act of making the Aragale. It is against this radical subjective political backdrop that the rapid dissolution of the Aragale in the late summer of uh, last year must be understood. How could a mass movement infused with such idealism and potential simply vanish from view as a political force in spite of the persistence of the objective conditions of crisis? If we compare the Aragalea to the revolutions of 1789, 1871, the commune, the Soviet or the party. Moreover, to speak with Badiou again, the whole upheaval lacked an idea, such as equality, liberty, fraternity, or all power to the Soviets. This is nowhere more evident than in the famous uh, July uh, 9th uh, declaration of the popular demands of the Aragalea by an ad hoc committee assembled from various groups camped out in Golfes. Aside from the immediate demand for the government to resign, the six or essentially five demands of this now historic statement are obsessively focused on mitigating corruption through constitutional reform with barely an acknowledgement of the contingent or structural dimensions of the economic crisis at the root of the Aragale. Most conspicuously, this statement includes no vision of a systemic alternative to neoliberalism and remains trapped within the middle class dream of free markets without corruption. Needless to say, it falls short of a revolutionary manifesto. In some ways, this is to be expected from a mostly spontaneous protest movement such as the Aragale, which had no time to be nourished by years of organizing and theorizing in the ambit of revolutionary or social democratic political parties, trade unions, or peasant mobilizations, as was the case with the Russian and Chinese revolutions. <clears throat> Spontaneity Horizontally, horizontality and pluralism are appealing ideas, but as recently witnessed in Sri Lanka, they have their limits. The July 9th statement was issued by an admittedly diverse and disparate collection of groups gathered in golf phase, <clears throat> with many differences and no shared radical political vision <clears throat> beyond a liberal consensus evidently oblivious to neoliberalism. <clears throat> It is therefore not surprising that within the disappointing totality of the Aragalea demands, the fleeting mention of debt cancellation reads like an isolated afterthought, as does the call for a people's council in the third of the six points of the golf phase program. <clears throat> as such, we are obliged to read this statement between the lines to spot its most radical ideas, which are smothered under the liberal middle class and NGOist ideology of the Aragale. Particularly pertinent for a <clears throat> generous reading of the Aragale manifesto is its third demand. <coughs> so this is the third demand. Uh, I'm quoting. Subsequent to the resignation of the Gota Ranil government, an interim government which subscribes to the economic, social, and political aims and aspirations of the people's struggle, Janata Aragale, should be established. <coughs> A people's council, which has legal standing through which representatives of the uh, Janata Aragale will be able to effectively engage and mediate with the interim government, should be established. <coughs> The small group responsible for this intriguing invocation of a people's council, as well as the agreeable call for uh, debt cancellation in the golf face demand sheet, 
is virtually unknown to the Sri Lankan general public. Under the name of Socialist People's Forum, it includes a collection of former members of traditional left parties, radical trade union activists and Marxist intellectuals, some of whom also organized a series of lectures, discussions and publications self-identified as the Marx School, which operate mostly under the tutelage of uh, Sumana Sirilianage, Emeritus Professor of Economics at Peradeniya University and former member of the Trotskyite party, the LSSP. The Marx School published a pamphlet in August last year, just as the Aragale was starting to lose steam after Kota, in fact, went home. Uh, that's the book, you know, so uh, yeah, uh, the, the People's Council, the form of people's power in struggle, <clears throat> explains the significance of the People's Council as a core concept concerning the organization of the people's struggle. It is in this text that we find the only attempt to theorize an organizational form adequate to the Aragale from a radical political standpoint. In an argument that closely follows in this book, uh, the experiences of the Paris Commune, the Russian revolutions, uh, 1905, February and October 1917, and May 68 in France. In contrast to the predominantly <coughs> liberal populist and middle class sentiment of the Aragale, <coughs> the authors of uh, People's Council are commendably clear in their vision of the commune form as a component of Lenin and others famously called dual power, with unambiguous reference to the role played by the Soviets in the Russian revolutions. You won't, of course, hear about any of this in the Guardian reports on the Aragale, but the revival of the notions of dual power and commune form, form by a distinct minority of activists seems to be the most promising contribution of the Aragale in the realm of Sri Lankan political thought. The first publication of the Marx School during the Aragale, in fact, appeared before uh, this one uh, in June uh, 2022. Uh, and that is called a People's Solution to the Economic Crisis, written by Jagat Guru Singh, Sumana Sirilianagi, and Kalpa Rajapaksa. In this booklet, uh, these three economists make an audacious argument. The economic crisis in Sri Lanka is overblown by politicians, apparatchiks, and the rentier and merchant classes, precisely to manufacture the illusion that there is no alternate alternative to begging from the IMF and implementing their neoliberal prescriptions in yet another round of debt restructuring. They don't deny the gravity of the foreign exchange crisis in the present, but they insist that it is primarily a product of the steady accumulation of sovereign debt since 1977, rather than a consequence of the trade deficit. To make their case, these Marx School economists consult the Central Bank report of 2021 and calculate that Sri Lanka's imports and exports during the pandemic lockdown each amounted to approximately 20 billion US dollars, insisting further that if non-essential imports were discounted from these numbers, the cost of imports could have been brought down to about 15 billion US dollars. So the real problem they point out is uh, not the trade deficit uh, as such, but the burden of servicing a 50 billion US dollar debt, <coughs> including an interest payment of 7.3 billion uh, dollars due, but defaulted in uh, 2022. The crisis appears to be beyond repair without further accumulation of foreign debt only if our thinking is restrained by the neoliberal ideology marketed by the IMF. And the crisis is unresolvable within the IMF's own neoliberal framework, which has repeatedly proved to be the problem rather than the solution. Against this backdrop, the Marx School economists urge us to think outside the ideological box of the IMF and their Sri Lankan agents in order to formulate a genuinely viable left strategy out of the crisis. 
The message is clear. Be realistic. Demand the impossible. Their heretical proposal to deal with the crisis therefore includes a five-year moratorium on debt, de-dollarization of foreign reserves, import substitution, export development, progressive income and corporate taxation, banking reforms to promote industrialization, sustainable agriculture, and food security. These measures are reminiscent of Sri Lanka's successful response to the 1973 economic crisis in the wake of global oil and food price hikes. The solution then was conceived and implemented under the direction of the Trotsky's finance minister, Dr. N. M. Pereira, a leading figure of the Sri Lankan Marxist left and former student of uh, Harold Lasky at the London School of Economics. Uh, I, uh, I was, you know, about seven years old during that 1973 crisis, and I remember going with my Russian card to the corporate, local cooperative, you know, the, as we were urged to grow vegetables in our backyards and so on and so forth, right? And then, of course, you know, the, uh, the, there's a lot of stories about Dr. N. M. Perera being a Trotskyite uh, uh, and, and the finance minister. You know, so one uh, uh, friend of mine commented that, you know, these Trotskyites, you know, they didn't believe uh, in socialism in one country, but they believed in socialism in one ministry. Right. You know, the, the, the finance ministry. <laughs> the, but, but the fact is they actually did manage the crisis. So with some memory of that, the present proposal outlined in uh, uh, People's Solution to the Economic Crisis by Lienege and his comrades likewise focuses on the need for national economic planning and industrialization, the importance of which cannot be overstated in the Sri Lankan context. <laughs> Uh, the, so th this is a graph again from uh, uh, Vagisha Gunasekara, the chief economist uh, of UNDP in Sri Lanka, showing how you know the kind of the decline in industry, you know, uh, in the neoliberal uh, era, uh, especially the last uh, uh, three decades. Anyway, in general. The proposals of the Marx School are predicated on three principles that are fundamentally opposed to IMF's neoliberal and indeed imperialist uh, policy prescriptions. Responses to the economic crisis should not place a disproportionate burden on the lower classes, nor should the res these responses to crisis further increase the sovereign debt. And the sovereign debt itself shall not be permitted to undermine the sovereignty of Sri Lanka. A third publication from the uh, prolific Marx School appeared in October last year, as the government of Sri Lanka was locked in secretive negotiations with its predatory creditors over a new IMF package of basically debt bondage to finance and frontier capital. It is entitled The IMF Prescription, A Cure or Another Disease. And uh, this booklet is dedicated to the renowned Belgian Marxist economist uh, Ernest Mandel. This publication too offers a stinging critique of the neoliberal policies advocated by the IMF, especially the raising of interest rates, reducing welfare and devaluing the rupee, all of which are likely not to save but to sink Sri Lanka deeper into crisis with greater inflation, unemployment, and loss of national income as well as industrial capacity. The authors of this little book are especially critical of IMF's effective opposition to a national economic plan to raise productivity in Sri Lanka. In response, they recommend a discriminating policy on imports, development of industries for domestic consumption as well as exports, and measures to rein in illegal yet widespread outflows of foreign exchange from Sri Lanka. They conclude by urging Sri Lankans to break decisively with the stranglehold of neoliberal capitalism brokered by the IMF. We must, of course, bear this in mind. What I have just presented is a sampling of the thinking of only a handful of radical activists trained more or less in the Marxist tradition who could not, during the course of the events of last year, become the driving force of the Aragalia in the face of other well-endowed organizations hovering over golf face. Groups uh, favored by the media and cheered by the US ambassador. 
But the literature on forms of radical economic policy and political organization produced by even a small minority of activists over the last few months and their lived experiences in the process of struggle against the economic and political system, these may yet prove to be the most durable and valuable product of the Aragale. Uh, and there are other books that I haven't talked about. You know, this, for example, is a collection of uh, articles uh, from the daily newspaper or the weekly now newspaper of the, the Communist Party. You know, it's called the Neoliberal Virus and the Economic Crisis, and this was just published last week while I was in Sri Lanka. Uh, and it includes that uh, statement on debt signed by 182 uh, academics. Finally, uh, it remains to be noted that in the left political landscape of Sri Lanka, the basic ideas of the Marx school activists are not alone. Critiques of neoliberalism have also been formulated by traditional left parties, including the Communist Party, the LSSP, and breakaway factions from the JVP, the People's Liberation Front. Although regrettably compromised by their coalitions with the Rajapaksa regimes, these parties have now, now begun to distance themselves from that questionable legacy and reassemble as a potentially independent left parliamentary power. Just as the two traditionally dominant mainstream parties in Sri Lankan politics, the neoliberal UNP and the formerly social democratic SLFP, have all but lost their political credibility and influence in the country. In this context, an election campaign statement in 2019 by the former uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party, uh, Div Gunasekara, now seems uh, prophetic. In a speech entitled, What is to be done? He clearly anticipated the impending economic crisis in Sri Lanka, if not the Aragale itself, and proposed an urgent change of course away from the neoliberal doctrine inaugurated in 1977. Dew's uh, 10 point program also underlined the vital need for such things as national sovereignty, economic planning, human resource development, infrastructure development, tax reform, agricultural development, export development, and industrialization. The difference between the Marx School and Dew, therefore, is not about economics, but political strategy. The old left of the communists and Trotskyists uh, had since at least the 1960s committed itself to the parliamentary road to socialism in Sri Lanka. Whereas the Marx school of much more recent vintage speaks of the commune form as the rational political kernel of the Aragale. As I see it, there need not be an enormous contradiction uh, between these two as left political strategies, especially if viewed within a contemporary and creative perspective on dual power, such as the one proposed by our Greek comrade uh, Panagiotis Sotiris in a series of speeches and papers over the last five years or so. After all, the situation in Sri Lanka requires socialist parties and radical social movements to forge a working unity against the neoliberal political consensus and the neoliberal economic doctrine. To develop a concept of such solidarity premised on dual power with due attention to the need for the development of productive forces alongside new forms of political organization, the Sri Lankan left could do worse than to adopt for the present conditions another famous slogan from Lenin. Communism equals electrification plus Soviet power. I'll end there. Thank you, Kanishka, for this very interesting discussion. So now, uh, if there is any question, who would like to ask something on Kanishka's talk? Hi, um, I have a question slash comment <laughs> to ask. Uh, it might sound a little bit uh, controversial, <laughs> but I'll ask it anyway. Um, 
uh, after I've read uh, Greber's uh, debt, uh, the first 5,000 years, um, um, a, a, an idea formed in my, in my mind uh, about uh, deconstructing uh, the, the concept of debt uh, and uh, the negative meaning it has, uh, especially uh, in the last century and during uh, neoliberalism and uh, financialization. Um, I believe uh, a common mistake um, the left uh, does is uh, connecting debt uh, to neoliberalism. Um, in my mind, uh, a welfare state has to have has uh, debt because its purpose is not uh, profit. So debt is inev inevitable. inevitable. Um, so uh, I think that uh, the whole discourse of of uh, the left uh, nowadays, um, not the whole left, but <laughs> a lot of leftist parties, um, especially in the countries that uh, were hit the hardest during uh, the 2008 uh, financial crisis, are focusing on, uh, on, a, on a debt uh, narrative, and that is, uh, th that is similar to the narrative uh, the neoliberal governments uh, and parties have, because um, Taking as an example, as an example the, the current government uh, here in Greece, uh, they're focusing on um, uh, economic uh, uh, development uh, through, um, uh, through investments, um, which is the core of neoliberalism. Um, so that's the, the question in my mind. Should we, should we start deconstructing the idea of debt? Uh, should, we should we focus as uh, but you said <laughs> more on in politics than um, than the, the economics per se. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So uh, yeah, like uh, in fact, you know, in uh, one of the books that I uh, kind of showed in the images, there is a brief discussion of uh, David Graeber, you know, that you know. So the uh, uh, the. Uh, but anyway, my kind of perspective on this is, of course, you know, uh, the what is important is what kind of debt and on whose terms, right? You know, so the the problem, you know, uh, in the neoliberal context, you know, uh, that you know Sri Lanka has experienced for the you know since 1977, the the kind of debt that uh, we have been uh, forced to work with uh, is not really uh, a political decision coming from the people of Sri Lanka. You know, there's no democracy about it. You know, the, and, and the, so it's a situation in which the sovereignty of the people has been undermined. You know, so in this case, you know, that actually uh, works uh, in a to like you know there's an imperialist uh, uh, aspect to it, uh, but also there's a class aspect to it. You know, so people within uh, so the imperialist aspect is you know of course it is the the interests of you know the class of you know finance capitalists and rentier classes. Uh, uh, pr the in Sri Lanka are going to you know for 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 them you know uh, they are have been you know mostly comfortable you know with this kind of debt but it really hurts the 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 workers the peasants and so on right you know so we have to understand you know with all due respect to David Graeber you know we have to understand understand the imperialist and you know class. Uh, uh, dimensions, you know, of how that actually works in particular historical and political contexts. Right? So my approach to this question is to ask, okay, like for example, to take to become concrete in this situation, you know, the, because I was in, involved in various discussions about uh, the politics of, you know, going to the IMF for a debt restructuring agreement you know in 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 Sri Lanka in this present situation so if you kind of follow you know the IMF kind of prescription you know with uh, 
uh, cutting uh, state expenditures, you know, reducing the debt that way, and also uh, raising interest rates. Who is this going to benefit, right? You got to ask, right, this kind of question. So it is the it is really the the class of finance capital, and in in Sri Lanka itself, the the rentier class, you know, people who own assets, right? You know, uh, who are going to benefit, right? So the 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 uh, and I say this partly also because you know the there is a uh, negotiation you know, behind closed doors going on with the creditors, sort of overseen by the IMF, right? So who's negotiating, uh, uh, you know, there are three very, like, uh, influential economists advising the president of Sri Lanka in this negotiation, you know, with the creditors, right? One of them is the uh, person going to debate with Yanis Varoufakis on the 22nd of uh, February, you know, in that uh, event that I uh, showed, uh, Indrajit Kumaraswamy, uh, and there are two others, Shanta Rajan and Shamini Kure. So, uh, so when uh, these academics sent that uh, letter on uh, debt cancellation, right, uh, or debt relief, uh, this is being recorded, right? You know, so yeah, I'll say it anyway. You know, so uh, I, I was also one of the signet, uh, you know, I also signed that letter. And so uh, somebody sent this letter to, you know, these advisors, you know, to the president, and they kind of wrote back, uh, one of them, you know, wrote back and maybe even uh, made a statement in public saying that this kind of uh, request or, you know, demand for debt cancellation is very counterproductive, you know, in the situation, right? So I was wondering <coughs> in that situation, whose interests are uh, these people promoting in the negotiations with the IMF and the creditors, right? Are they promoting the interests of all Sri Lankans or like a particular class of Sri Lankans? Uh, so, so I would always like try to ask like who is uh, going to benefit, you know, from a particular approach to that, right? <clears throat> Other questions? But I, I, I do okay. agree with you, of course, that, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, it is, you can easily imagine scenarios in which it is <coughs> eminently reasonable to borrow, you know, to, uh, but again, it uh, depends on for what purpose and for whom. Yeah. 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 So the welfare state needs borrowing too, right? <coughs> Hello. Hello, thank you for your presence here. Uh, I would like to give us a short comment on the, the dollarization strategy you talked about. And uh, more precisely, if it's possible, I want you to comment us on the perceptions around that strategy, especially on the people who were in Sri Lanka, on the classes. Okay, so this is uh, also a very you know, controversial question, obviously, you know, so uh, the, so the fact that the dollar is the default currency of the world uh, is a problem, right? You know, the, uh, and, uh, and this uh, basically, you know, undermines the sovereignty and the independence of especially, you know, small, kind of uh, econ economies like uh, Sri Lanka. And it puts, of course, you know, the American uh, interests yeah, at, uh, like in a very strong, you know, dominant position uh, relative to uh, all other states. So in this context, the emergence of a, you know, possibly multipolar world, uh, there's a perception in Sri Lanka, not by everyone, but by some, uh, people on the left, uh, that the emergence of a multipolar world offers a small 
country like Sri Lanka, the opportunity to not just like trade, I mean, you know, deal in the dollar, but in other uh, currencies as well. You know, and therefore to uh, escape to some extent the incredible control, you know, that the IMF and, you know, you know, basically the US, you know, interests have in the Sri Lankan economy, right? So the imposition of various conditionalities, you know, as a, you know, in the, in the context of debt agreements, debt restructuring agreements, uh, you know, if we, uh, if a country like Sri Lanka kind of diversifies its uh, foreign exchange reserves, uh, you can negotiate with more people, you know, different people, and not just with one entity, right? And we can probably get a better deal overall, right? So this is the this is the practical side of it, right? And there's of course you know, the lots of questions about okay, who are you going to negotiate with? You know, China, Russia, uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries, right? And so on and so forth. But uh, so there's a political aspect of this, but also the, you know, un not unrelated, you know, the practical aspect, you know, you can kind of, uh, you can probably get a better deal, you know, if you have uh, different arrangements with different uh, sources of foreign exchange. Right? Yeah. <coughs> uh, Well, uh, first of all, thank many, many thanks for your presentation and, and your writing on, on this and your uh, other writing on, on the Sri Lanka situation. I was wondering a little bit if you can expand on, on, on the question of, of the pertinence of the, of the notion of dual power. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think one of the questions to be asked, and I will use a phrase from, uh, from Gramsci. Gramsci says at some point that the crucial question is, for the subaltern to become state. He does not mean simply to, you know, be the state or, you know, gain. He means that they have this kind of aspiration. The aspiration that it is possible to have, let's say, a subaltern, subaltern governmentality in a certain mm -hmm. way. And at the same time, we've seen very big uh, social explosions in the past 10 or 20 years where you see this, uh, in certain instances, even negation of this self-negation of this possibility. If you look at Gilaison uh, in, in France, for example, you have an enormous uh, you know, force and at the same time rejection without this kind of aspiration that we can rule this mm. country in a different way. Mm. The Greek situation is more, was more, more contradictory on that. That's why perhaps we even started thinking about mm. dual power. But I was wondering if you, if you could see in the, in, the, in the Sri Lankan case moments where this kind of aspiration of, of the popular classes, that they mm. can, you know, w we can run things in a different way or in a certain way, how can we, you know, elaborate this? How can we uh, enhance this tendency in actual movements? Uh, well, but you basically mm. ne negate that, but that's another. Mm. <laughs> That's another story. I was wondering, mm. uh, what do you think upon, upon these questions in particular? Yeah, yeah, for me, you know, this is actually the most important and important and current political question, you know, no doubt, you know, in Sri Lanka. And uh, I was particularly tuned into this by some of the literature that I was uh, uh, presenting today, which, uh, which is pretty recent in Sri Lanka. Right, and uh, so the, I think there are, there's a bit of history to this, you know, which is that the, the left in Sri Lanka, you know, the socialist or let's say the Marxist left, you know, uh, started in the 30s, right, and formed uh, cadre-based, you know, parties, you know, uh, starting in the mid 30s and and became uh, very successful very successful in the earliest elections you know kind of like the 
French Communist Party immediately after the Second World War, the Italian Socialist and Communist Parties. So they had that kind of electoral power. So there was always this uh, tension, you know, within the left, you know, between kind of a uh, Leninist or a, even a Trotskyist, you know, kind of a approach to dual power and a revolutionary strategy in that sort of classical, you know, Russian uh, revolution kind of a way uh, with the, uh, uh, on the one hand, and kind of the more social democratic, you know, the parliamentary road to socialism, right? So in the 30s, 40s, you know, this tension was a very much more productive one, you know, but I think after the 50s, you know, through the 60s and 70s, uh, strategically, you know, it was resolved in favor of the parliamentary road to socialism, right? But then in the 70s, uh, there were various uh, groups, you know, that broke away, you know, from the the main, two main left parties, the Trotsky, Lanka Samasamaja Party or the Socialist Equality Party and the Communist Party, you know, from the mid 50s also lined up with, very much with Moscow. Uh, so there was a the Maoist breakaway from the Communist Party and further breakaways, you know, and so on. And these some of these breakaway groups then attempted, uh, you know, f formed a, this party called the People's Liberation Front and attempted a revolution, you know, insurrection in 1971. But not with like a very sophisticated idea of dual power, but like more like a insurrectionary and even putschist kind of a kind of a attempt, right? In seventy one, so so the after that, you know the you know the, these debates kind of like you know the left, you know neoliberalism became dominant and the left became kind of a very weak as a parliamentary force, and these discussions kind of uh, more or less disappeared. You know, so they actually <laughs> re were revived. Uh, last year, you know, some, by some of these uh, young, uh, very interesting activists, right, uh, that I was uh, talking about. So right now, I think uh, there's a situation where the, uh, the old left parties are no longer electorally powerful or politically very influential, you know, but on the other hand, you know, there is this sort of, uh, like popular protests, you know, and uh, which are very ambiguous, you know, like, uh, and that's part, one thing I tried to explain, you know, there's a very upper class and a middle class and very liberal uh, aspect to the protests last year, but, you know, but within that, you know, there are these groups that I particularly featured uh, in the discussion today that are very serious about uh, reviving, you know, an idea of dual power. So what they, <coughs> uh, what they mean by uh, the uh, dual power and particularly their own kind of uh, attempts to think through the, what I call the, or they call the commune form, uh, is uh, kind of, a, is very close to, you know, Lenin, I think, you know, so the, uh, so they are trying to imagine the organizational form of a, like a, like a workers uh, subaltern kind of a form of power that is capable, at least initially, uh, as acting as a counterweight, you know, to the liberal democratic state, you know, as a more organic and more directly democratic uh, representation uh, of uh, people's power, right? The, so, so this is where the discussion is at the moment, right? And some of the, like, so the, the discussions of the, uh, uh, on dual power in the two or three books that I, sh uh, you know, showed you, they actually happen kind of uh, in a very spontaneous way as well. You know, so Sumanis Rilienege, I remember, you know, he's like posting on his Facebook page, you know, a paragraph for, you know, like a few, uh, uh, passages every day as the movement, uh, you know, struggle was going on, you know, so on their feet, you know, they're thinking, okay, people are occupying this space and having all these discussions, but there's no uh, real uh, agreement, 
you know, among the various people in the streets and uh, and golf is that uh, public space about uh, what this struggle, what shape this struggle uh, could potentially assume, uh, right? And so, so it's a kind of a ongoing fluid kind of a discussion at the moment, right? But I think this is where uh, this is the most important uh, kind of strategic political discussion that is going on uh, right now, in my view. So, I mean, your paper, uh, your, the series of things that you had written, you know, for me, were very thought-provoking in this sense. You know, to, you know, as you pointed out, you know, there's a kind of the very specific understanding of dual power, you know, coming out of Lenin that was extremely conjunctural, you know, like, you know, uh, because Lenin was writing, you know, this stuff between February and October in uh, 1917. But Trotsky is more kind of a retrospective, you know, uh, writings on the on dual power um, <coughs> uh, puts it in a like a longer historical perspective, right? You know, so dual power is a, a kind of a, a scenario that we can see in a number of revolutionary situations. You know, even going back to the English Revolution, right? So the uh, and there are more kind of strategic, like you know, other. Uh, approaches within the Bolshevik party that is different from Lenin. Again, as you point out, you know, the Zinoviev Kamenev kind of position, right? About uh, how this relates to the idea of a dictatorship of the proletariat and uh, a post-revolutionary government, right? You know, should that kind of government also have as a counterweight, you know, uh, uh, something like uh, some kind of a counterweight in, in the form of a dual power arrangement, you know, to uh, make sure that the uh, the workers and persons' interests are adequately and fully kind of present and represented, right? Yeah, these are open questions, kind of you this. You know, so the, uh, uh, so at least I'm happy that some people <laughs> have brought it up in the Sri Lankan context because without it, uh, I'm, I would be, to be honest, at a loss, you know, to think about, okay, how to make sense of what happened, right? Yeah. <coughs> Philippa? Thank you very much. Mm, maybe you know there was a, a debate in the French television between Alain Badiou yeah. and Yanis Varoufakis. Yeah. Uh, some years before, and actually it was a, a very harsh debate mm -hmm. because, uh, but you was very aggressive yeah. towards uh, Yanis Varoufakis mm. because of course, but you think that Varoufakis is a reformist and uh, all his ideas are very soft, let's say, in order <coughs> to change things. So it was a very interesting discussion where actually we, we can understand that uh, there are a lot of contradiction between different schools of thought about what to do, because of course strategy is interesting, mm. but in order to do what? Mm. Okay. Mm. And so you said that b between the Marx uh, school mm. and the Communist Party, actually there is no so much contradiction. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, mm. maybe there is mm. actually, because you said, uh, okay, what we can do, and you, um, you uh, remind us uh, a solution that we know that they are there since a very long time, for mm. example, industrialization or um, try to build a new economic growth model mm. and things like that. Okay, but these ideas, we know these ideas, but we, we are living in a world where the global machine of the, the capital, let's say, flows are very complex. And actually, we, we even when we try to, 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 to work on that, I mean, academic in the, in the universities, researchers, it's very complicated thing. So let's, tr it's, uh, it's how, how much possible is to find uh, the, the real path mm. in order to, to, to have a breakthrough about mm. what to do. Because, you know, unilaterally, a country like Sri Lanka mm. or Greece, we cannot do a lot of things. And we need new, um, new ideas, new, new ways to, to stop this, you know, these um, free flows of the capital around the world. So we need new processes, let's say. 
And I'm not sure that we are thinking about that. Mm. We're discussing a lot about strategy, mm. but not about the content of the, of the policy change. Let's say. Yeah. Because all these ideas are old ideas, okay? Mm. Industrialization, <coughs> what it means today? We have a digital, digital capital system, capitalist system. So what means exactly industrialization, mm. you know? Uh, even for a country that uh, was as Greece, Sri Lanka, exactly mm. the same path. Huh? Mm. So I'm, mm. I would like to have your okay. idea about that. Thanks. Okay, so like maybe I can say roughly three things, you know, in response. So the the uh, so the first of all, like just a clarification, you know. So I I what I wanted to say, I'm not sure exactly what I said, but I wanted to say was. Uh, you know, uh, uh, at the level of, you know, economic thinking, uh, there is not a huge difference, you know, between the, the old left uh, and the, the Marx school. You know, and that is partly because some of the Marx school people also come from the old left, you know, and uh, are from that heritage, right? And they also remember, you know, the attempts to uh, modernize and industrialize, you know, in the 50s and the 60s, you know, up to the neoliberal times. And this was like not a roaring success, but not a complete failure either, you know, like in a, especially in a country like Sri Lanka, you know, with very good standards in many social indicators, right, uh, with a welfare state, like uh, education, health, and, you know, and so on. So, and you know some success also with uh, industry, right? Although of, I agree, it is different today, you know. But the uh, so, but I also wanted to say that there is a difference, you know, between the old left uh, and the, this sort of kind of kind of thinking represented by the Marx school when it comes to political strategy, right? And so, and that is because the old left has for many years thought in terms of parliamentary politics. Now the, the Marx school, you know, they were basically kind of, uh, you know, the, the Marx school existed before the Aragale or the, this struggle, right? You know, a few years before. I mean, I have participated in some of their events. You know, I did some lecture on Gramsci, for example. You know, so, uh, and that's how I know that they are the ones who inserted that phrase, you know, in the demand. You know, like the, the about the People's Council and, uh, and so on, right? So the the uh, so the, uh, at the level of political strategy, there's a difference, right? But I think the uh, this difference is uh, not a kind of a. Uh, it could be a productive difference, you know, not a completely irreconcilable contradiction. Right? If we start thinking through the notion of dual power, that is another use of this concept, you know, which is to say that the actually existing state is a you know, form of political power, but there's another form of political power that can come from the, let's say, to put it in non-Marxist language, you know, from the grassroots or from the bottom up, let's say, okay? So the, uh, the, so the question then is, you know, how do you kind of uh, negotiate the tension between these two kinds of power and find some productive articulation, right? So that is the political question. But, but I think your, your, your concern, if I understood it correctly, is really about kind of the, the uh, like, the the difficulties you know of uh, uh, actually uh, becoming economically sovereign and independent right uh, as at the level of countries now this is of course you know very difficult you know i i don't dispute that at all and uh, uh, but but again, you know, on this question too, there has there is a bit of a history, you know, from the kind of the tradition of you know the non-alignment uh, kind of non-aligned politics, and especially the tri-continental, you know, tradition within non-aligned non uh, uh, the non-aligned movement, uh, 
to <clears throat> form some kind of, you know, international solidarity, you know, between various countries to, you know, create alternative economic relations at a broader global and regional scales, right? You know, so Sami Ramin, you know, talked about the idea of uh, delinking, right? So delinking did not mean, you know, just like, you know, cutting off every, uh, you know, all contact with the outside world. You know, it meant like, you know, kind of, you know, forming alliances with uh, countries in similar situations for a uh, shared, you know, political project, right, at an international scale, right? You know, so the tricontinental movement was uh, was a great uh, reference point, you know, for people like Sami Ramin, right, within the non-aligned movement, right? So I think we need uh, to revive, you know, uh, rebuild some of those uh, 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 kinds of politics as well, right, and solidarities, right? You know, so obviously, like, you can't solve all of this just in Sri Lanka itself, right? And so this is, I think, why, you know, we need international discussions, you know, like this, and, uh, and to kind of uh, build connections, you know, with, uh, you know, on the basis of different people's and countries' experiences, yeah. So, you know, maybe like, you know, in Latin America, you know, with the so-called pink tide, you know, there was a bit of a direction, a movement in this kind of direction, right? You know, it goes up and down in circles, but I think, you know, it is uh, the idea, of, you know, delinking, you know, the tricontinental, uh, all that stuff suddenly becomes, uh, pertinent along with the idea of dual power, right? <clears throat> Who else wants to ask something? Any other question? Okay, I have to ask them some stuff. <clears throat> so my first question is that if um, the political differences between the um, communist mm -hmm. Trotskyist and uh, the more commune stuff are related with uh, religious or uh, uh, racial differences within um, <coughs> Sri Lanka. Uh, the second question is, I mean, to which extent I would like to tell us a bit about the experience of the 1970s. Mm. I mean, that you said that there was an attempt to against IMF and all this mm. kind of stuff. I mean, which is the context and which was uh, what happened, and if this type of experience triggers a discussion uh, nowadays? I mean, if it's a kind of ex inspiration of, for current politics or not. Um, and the third thing is that um, I agree with, you, uh, what, with you, what you said and about the um, delinking and um, the experience of uh, Sri Lanka uh, that, I mean, does extend discussion um, within these people that you mentioned um, uh, about the Latin, Latin American experience? Because, for example, um, the debt crisis has already happened. I mean, it's not really a new thing uh, between uh, in Latin America. There was okay. There was not 100% successful, but yeah. And the fourth question. So okay. And I will, if, if you find any analogies between the Greek and the Sri Lankan experience of the debt crisis. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll start with the last one. Okay, so the, yeah. yeah, so I think I think there is some uh, some analogy, you know, like the and we were talking about this a little bit last night, I guess, you know, whether Greece is a third world country, you know, like and the. Uh, and yeah, there are actually some structural similarities, you know, like uh, Greece being kind of a, like a peripheral zone, you know, of Europe and, and also like, you know, being a largely service economy, you know, with a not a very strong industrial base and again, having the same kinds of uh, uh, structural problems with that, right? And uh, the, so ba some basic, uh, formal structural similarities can be um, observed for sure. And, you know, uh, I was, you know, 
tuned into the debt crisis in Greece 2009 because I mean I had just spent some months in Europe uh, leading up to that time you know the and I remember you know very clearly like you know Yanis Varoufakis you know trying to argue with the Troika right you know uh, like very much like some of these uh, activists uh, 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 thinking right now you know that you know you need to cancel the debt uh, and you know putting us in more debt is actually uh, really stupid you know even from a you know capitalist point of view you know in some way and and so on and so forth right you know so this kind of uh, sentiment you see quite a bit on some circles of the Sri Lankan left and it is no surprise that he was asked to sign that letter and he's invited to uh, uh, debate you know some of the neoliberal ideologues you know uh, who are very influential right now in the negotiations with the IMF and the creditors in Sri Lanka so similarities yes uh, the the other questions are a little bit difficult for me to answer you know particularly uh, Latin America the thing is like of course no there's no uh, example I can think of where uh, a country has really dealt with this problem successfully you know to offer a model for everyone else but this is because you know this kind of thing cannot be uh, done individually you know by one country right you know so we uh, here i agree with you i think you know we need a bit of a broader systemic change you know so you need like regional alliances and a kind of a uh, some way of you know cooperation for countries uh, in this situation right so in the 60s 70s you know the ideas of delinking was sort of had some traction you know because they, it was still the time of the non-aligned movement and the tricontinental aspirations and so on but after the neoliberal uh, uh, after neoliberalism became kind of hegemonic you know globally that became only an idea you know so it was very difficult to put into practice so i think today maybe like you know if american hegemony you know comes to an end and you know there's some kind of a i don't know if whether it's going to be uh, succeeded by a better model but at, if there's some kind of a more plural like i don't know you know with other countries also becoming equally influential in the global economy a new situation could emerge right and uh, so we have to be open to that possibility and think uh, creatively about what the opportunities are right? and uh, so you know there's a, <coughs> a professor based in uh, um, like uh, Netherlands you know who has written a lot about the Sri Lankan economic uh, issues uh, Howard Nicholas heterodox economist uh, so he was he did a lecture in Sri Lanka while I was there in the last couple of weeks and so he was asked this question whether okay if we don't uh, go with the IMF what are the options right where I mean we still need that as you know like and uh, uh, to come out of this so what are the options so he said well actually you know there are other options you know we can kind of negotiate with bilater bilateral loans with number of other countries right uh, it doesn't have to be with these like you know like the international sovereign bond traders you know in wall street or wherever right and uh, so it's just that you know we have been so programmed and trained to think that there is no alternative to the imf and that kind of neoliberal prescription so you got to like break from that you know and how to break of course is the question but but i think the possibilities are emerging right and we need to kind of think uh, i mean they may not be like the the most kosher you know politically you know and so on and so forth but but the uh, but they are emerging and we need to take them very seriously 
I mean, there are other questions too, like this, uh, the 70s, 77 time. The, okay, so this, um, I think this was an interesting time uh, in Sri Lanka, but uh, the, uh, and I think I did mention in passing that, you know, 1977 was the last year in which Sri Lanka actually had a positive uh, budget and a, a foreign exchange uh, balance, right? And <clears throat> and this was after so-called like a socialist government, you know, from for seven years, which experienced some serious economic difficulties, uh, you know, some, there's obviously problems with every government, but in this case, <clears throat> the 1973 oil crisis and the relay, like the oil, pr oil prices <coughs> and related, you know, uh, food price, food grain prices, you know, really affected this government, right? And there was a crisis situation, uh, which is what I said I remember, you know, as a kid, like, you know, going with my ration card, you know, to pick up the daily bread and that kind of thing. And uh, the, but, you know, we sort of somehow emerged out of that situation, right? Yeah, so it is uh, the, but today, you know, that kind of solution does not seem possible, right? And uh, the, so it was with like, you know, restricting imports and, you know, living within our means, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, trying to promote uh, productivity industry, you know, in whatever ways we could. And, you know, like whatever you think of the Cold War and the Soviet Union, I mean, there was a lot of aid you know, for industries from the Soviet uh, Union and the socialist bloc, right, for countries like Sri Lanka. <clears throat> and, you know, so for example, the, there was a steel corporation and uh, steel, like, you know, and uh, so various industries were supported, you know, with uh, technical knowledge and, you know, uh, and uh, material assistance as well, you know, from the Soviet Union, right? and. So all that is now gone, right? You know, the, uh, so we have to kind of think a little bit differently about that as well. But the, so 70 to 77 was the end of an era, you know, for Sri Lanka. You know, after 77, it is all pretty much uh, neoliberalism. Right? Yeah. I... I also have a question, can yeah. I have a different kind? Thank yeah. you very much for your talk. Actually, I was wondering when I looked at the <coughs> pictures you were showing mm -hmm. about you know, the protesters yeah. addressing, you said that they were addressing a Western audience rather than the mm -hmm. Sri Lankan mm -hmm. masses. Mm -hmm. What is that Western audience? Mm. Part of the Western audience mm. is also the IMF, is also neoliberalism. Mm. Very often we see like in protests like we saw in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. hoping for an intervention from the liberal West. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is this audience? What mm. is the audience that mm. they talk to? Is mm. this representative of all protesters or are there different kind of, like, different kind of protesters mm. there mm. Mm. with hope to achieve different things? So mm. I just wanted, because yesterday we also talked about the use of English language mm -hmm. uh, by, uh, by the Sri Lankan elites as mm. a way of, like, distinction mm. from, the, mm. from the masses. So I was a bit intrigued by, mm. by that aspect of, uh, of the revolt, uh, okay. as it were. It's a good question, you know, like, and a great question, because, to be honest, like, I was really surprised myself, you know, when I, because I was not in Sri Lanka when the, all of this was happening. I went there in August, but, you know, that was a little bit after the most intense uh, weeks. So I also looked at the images from WhatsApp groups and, you know, Facebook and so on and so forth, and I was completely stunned to see all these signs in English. Because, you know, I grew up in Sri Lanka and I've seen many protests. I have never seen a political protest with English science, right? Uh, so this is like a completely uh, different phenomenon, right? So I thought what, what this meant, you know, and, uh, and it is because, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, uh, you know, there is a, at least, especially in Colombo, there was a very strong 
kind of a, the protests had all kinds of people, right? But it was the, the, the way it was represented, you know, in social media and in the mainstream media and even in like the, the, the uh, like in private uh, kind of communications, you know, had a disproportionate amount of English, you know, which meant that at the level of representation, uh, if not in the actual numbers of people on the street, uh, the middle classes and the upper classes were clearly dominant. Uh, so this was kind of the, uh, so that's one thing, right? You know, so that, that uh, the, the, the most obvious symptom, you know, the evidence of that dominance was the, the preponderance of English, you know, in all the visual representations and the, the discursive uh, uh, aspect, you know, of the uh, struggle. So the question is, you know, why is that? You know, like, uh, and I think it is on the one hand because it was the first time that the middle and upper classes were so inconvenienced, you know, in Sri Lanka, right? Uh, so there have been all kinds of suffering and crises, you know, and unions, you know, like trade unions and you know, have protested, there have been all kinds of strikes and so on and so forth. But signs of these strikes were not so, not like this, right? So here, uh, the, you know, the, 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 maybe part of the explanation is the, like the social media itself lends it's itself to English in some way, you know, with the hashtags and, you know, that kind of stuff. But beyond that, I think there was a kind of a uh, involvement of various media companies, you know, advertising firms and so on, you know, which actually kind of, uh, when the spontaneous movement started unfolding, you know, there were other interests, you know, including the American embassy, you know, like, uh, and various sort of, uh, uh, machinations, you know, behind the scenes, trying to kind of direct the struggle in a particular direction of uh, regime change, you know, wanted by certain kinds of uh, global powerful interests, let's say, right? Uh, so, uh, so the English is the lingua franca of that influence. <coughs> Any other question? Anyone who wants to ask something? Okay. So, um, thank you, Kaniska, for the discussion and your talk. And thank you, everyone who attended the event. And now uh, we will have a drink. Uh, but before the drink, um, in 14 days from now, on um, 20. 24th, uh, we'll have a, um, a new seminar that is uh, on behalf of the people who will speak uh, are coming from the Reporters United and the network of reporters yeah, aiming to support and investigate journalism in Greece. So, and uh, the talk will be about um, the scandal that has, you know, uh, emerged in Greece about war topic. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.